God is so good. God is so good. All right. We've been out of this pool pit for four weeks. Amen. And y'all know I'm raring to go. Amen. Four weeks. I want to give thanks to all the people that played a major role. Pastors, Ms. Y'all may be seated. Uh, played a major role in uh, showing us how much y'all appreciate uh, me and this ministry. All of the country, people of, of, of all of the country was showing this month of October how much you appreciate the work that we do in ministry. I want to thank y'all so much for every card, everything that was done. Thank y'all so much. We appreciate what you've done. And those who are put on the events and different various things, thank you so much. Also, too, for those that came out on our Wednesday night to our trunk or treat. Trunk, trunk and treat, trunk, something like that. But I, but I tell you, for those of you, amen, some people get religious and, and they don't. I used to feel that way that back in the day when you was a Christian, you didn't want to have a part of uh, Halloween. So you figured if I stay home and don't do anything about it, then that showed me just how holy I am. But that's not right. I think it's high time for us to go out there and meet the devil on this turf. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly what happened here on Wednesday night. There were people that came on this campus. Amen. Some had never been on a church campus before. There are some people that they were they were kind of shocked to see a church do that. And when they got here, we was just showing them some love of the Lord. Amen. And we can give you candy too without gooblins and goblins. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't have to have any skulls and all that stuff because we need to go where the devil at. Amen. We need to go on his turf and let him know that we're coming to take back what God has given to us. Amen. We come to take it back. So we're going to make it, if, if, if they say that's the devil's day, he's going to have to get them another day because we're going to be there. Next year, we're going to be there again. Amen. Hallelujah. So you got to change the day. And for those of you who are having problems with our garage sale, church ought not to be having no garage sale. Amen. But you hadn't read the scriptures. The, the church, the early church, when they first started, they had a garage sale. People were selling all they had to come, amen, and give, amen, so the ministry can function, amen. They sold houses and lands and, and cars. I don't know how much faith some of y'all got in here, amen. Would y'all sell some houses and lands or bring it, amen, so we can do work of ministry? But if you are, I, I kiss you right now. God bless you. God bless you. But it is biblical. You can do that. So let anybody tell you again that garage sales and selling stuff for church ministry is unbiblical. They're lying. They haven't read the scriptures. Amen. And for, for, for you guys doing that, I want to say thank you so much for giving me that week off. Now I'm ready to go. Amen. Hallelujah. We was preaching when, I, when we last stopped. We was preaching from the subject, the struggle is real. How many know the struggle is real? I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know what it is. But you know what? And we said that when you say the struggle is real, that means that you're dealing with something that you know is gay men taking everything you got to overcome this thing. In fact, you're still fighting it right now. I don't know the struggle is real in all kinds of ways and, and relationships, amen, in your body, sickness and the diseases and, and dealing with them chilling. <laughs> Dealing, dealing with all kinds of things that, and the struggle is real just to, just to keep your head above water. Amen. And we've been talking about that. And, and not only that, but we've been talking about that when this thing gets so tough, you need God to help you with some of this stuff. You can't do this on your own. You can't, you can't overcome some things that's trying to overcome you. You need the Lord in your life. And we've been studying from this book of Genesis, a man named Jacob. His name meant trickster. He was a deceiver, always trying to, to make a deal and trying to get over on somebody. And Jacob one day got tired of himself. And every now and then, all of us ought to get tired of you. You ought to get tired of you. Come on, somebody. You, I ain't talking about me. You ought to get tired of you every day. You don't, you don't ever get on your nerves sometimes? I get on my nerves sometimes. And because Paul said every time he said that he was going to do something, he wind up doing it. Have you ever been that place where you had to talk to yourself? You had to say, girlfriend, you weren't talking to nobody else. You had to talk to your own self. Say, girlfriend, you need to shut, you need to sit yourself down. Y'all ain't never had to talk to yourself? 
But there comes a time when we have to deal with ourselves because you can't deal with me until at first you know how to deal with yourself. How can you help me when you know you need help? Priest Jones, amen, somebody. In the book of Genesis, I want you to take the book of Genesis chapter 33. Turn there with me if you have your Bibles. The book of Genesis chapter 30, 33. The book of Genesis chapter 33. Genesis 33 and, and verse 1, verse 1. I don't know if they can put it up on the screen, but, but they do. Are, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto two handmaids. Don't, don't move for, from there for one second. We know that in our last message, we started at part four. We left Jacob struggling with God. We, 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 we left him, and God had left him with a limp. Now, in chapter 33, he had got word that his brother Esau was coming to meet him. The last thing that Jacob had heard from his brother Esau, that you know what, as soon as my daddy died, I'm going to kill you. Because Jacob had stolen his birthright. And Esau, at that moment, was harboring deep, deep resentment and hurt over what his brother has done to him. And can I ask a question? You don't have to say, yeah. Have anybody ever done anything to you? And if you could have got your hands on them. Oh, y'all ain't got too, y'all too cold on that side. But if anybody got to a place where, where you, you were hurt or you, they did something to you. And if you, if you could have just, if the only reason you didn't do them because you weren't close enough to them, you know, uh, or maybe there was somebody there kept you from doing what you wanted to do to them. You, and you said in yourself, as soon as Pastor Thomas get out of the way, I'm gonna, you, you, you better be glad. You, you never never had one of them better, you better be glad moments. Let me, come on, y'all. y'all, y'all. None of you never had one of those times. We said, "You better be glad. You better be. You better be. You, you better be glad, Mama home." Well, Jacob. Well, Esau had one of those moments with his brother because his brother had stolen his birthright, and and he said, "You know what? Listen, man. Listen. As soon as my daddy die, as soon as dad die, I'm gonna kill you." And the Bible says that his mother and Jacob came up with a plan to to let him move to with his uncle Laban, who was a bigger trickster than he was. And I told you in the last message, sometimes God will send you somebody, amen, somebody who will give you just what you gave somebody else, and not only that, but more than somebody else. I mean, I don't care how bad you is, there's somebody that's better than you. I don't care how, I don't care how, how, whatever you think you are, there's somebody always can do better than your best and they'll outshine your shiniest. Well, Jacob had to deal with his uncle Laban. 20 years, he had been in a house where Jacob seen, a, 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 I mean, identical, a, identical, uh, uh, emblem or sign of himself. This, this Uncle Jacob, this Uncle Laban was just like him. Amen. Just like him. And anybody, anybody like your uncle? I know some of y'all. Anybody got some crazy uncles over in Arkansas somewhere and, and you wonder why you crazy? I'm just, I'm just kidding with you. Sometimes you can get it from your uncle. Well, anyway, and Jacob, and the Bible says here that when Jacob were wrestling with God, God had to hit him in his, in his hip, and Jacob had a new walk. And we said that represented that when a person has a true encounter with God, you're going to always leave with a new walk. You can't tell me anybody that's saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost, you're going to act the same way. There's something that when you encounter a true relationship or encounter with God, you're going to walk away from that experience knowing that you do different. You think different. When, when God, has, God has came into your life, you can't tell me you think the same way. I don't care what somebody have done to you. God has a way of making you able to get past what has bothered you. And right now in this room, right now, there's some of you, if I had known you before you got saved, I would even sit next to you. And if some of y'all would have known me before, y'all know y'all wouldn't y'all wouldn't even listen to me either. But I'm here to tell you that everybody in this room are struggling or had a struggle with something in your life. And today I want to talk about something. I couldn't leave this. I had to come back. Now, now I, I don't normally do this. I normally do a series and I'm done. But the Holy Ghost told me I couldn't leave because there's some life lessons that I left. It's almost like eating neck bones. I thought I'd bring that up. Uh, 
it's almost like eating, eating neck bones. You can have four bones still sitting on the plate. You ever, anybody like me that you got a bone, you got three bones full on the plate, and that one bone you're spending 30 minutes trying to get that little gristle. You're talking about, you know, ain't nobody I'm talking about, and you're breaking the gristle trying to get that little piece. Well, I, we, we did this in this message. I was preaching. This message is a struggle. It's real. And, 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 and I like eating but on, but I could not leave it because there was, some, there was a little gristle in there that I, I, I didn't want to miss in, 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 in shutting out this series. You know somebody, and it would have been, it'd been robbery, but, but there's some life lessons, critical life lessons in the text that if I leave it, then you'll miss it. For instance, there are some people in this room right now, you're still struggling with unforgiveness. And you're still struggling with resentment for somebody who did you wrong. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm not talking to somebody. And you, you put on a happy face and, and you look good and you smell good, but deep down inside, there's somebody who done something to you and you hadn't got it. And every time that somebody mentions something like this, that person's face come up. And every time you see them, you try not to breathe their same air. And every time the name, every time somebody mentioned them that they got a promotion or did something, you frown. You cannot celebrate them doing something. You can tell, you can tell where people are with you when somebody's trying to celebrate you. Come on, somebody. Oh, Lord. I thought I hooped with that one. But, but, but here in the text in chapter 33 I'm reading, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and, and, and looked, and behold, Esau came. Golly. Esau came. He had heard that Esau was on his way. 20 years, he had heard his brother say, when you leave, I'm going to kill you. Now Jacob said, now it said Jacob lifted up his eyes. Not only did he hear about it, but now he see him. Esau came and, and with him, not only did Esau come, but Esau got some bad boys with him. It's bad enough I got to deal with you, but you got your homies too. But you're gonna, we're going to find and discover that sometimes it ain't what it looked like. Come on, somebody. It ain't always what it looked like, but it looked like because, see, sometimes guilt has a way of making you think the worst. Oh, they, they moved it. Don't give, give him that. And notice what he did. And he looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men, ragtags, unshaven, dirty, smelly men. Because y'all know the Bible says Esau was a rough man. Don't use no deodorant. <laughs> Don't shave. Y'all know them sounding good. Amen. No deal with it, no unshaven, amen, and don't care about shaving, and just, just rough looking. And Jacob remember what his brother looked like, and, and Esau coming, and not only is Jacob looking rough and, and unshaven, but he had 400 men that looked just like him. Can you, I want you to get into the text, get into the text for just one moment. Put yourself in the place of Esau. You have done somebody wrong, and they told you, I'm going to get you. The word has been on the street that I'm going to get you, and the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. Now he's got 400 men that look just as rough and stink as he is. So what he did, he divided the children unto Leah. That's the wife that his uncle tricked him into marrying. And as a rage of the woman, he went to marry in the first place. And until the two handmaids had two more women with children too. Oh, the boy was rolling. The boy was rolling. The boy was rolling. Verse, verse 2. Verse, verse 2 said, and he put the handmaidens, watch now, because if my brother started killing somebody, notice who he put out front. And he put the handmaidens and their children foremost. In other words, he put them out front. So by Esau is killing them, come on somebody, I still got a couple more camps in my pocket. Then Leah and her children, and after, listen, Rachel and Joseph hindermost. So Jacob said, as he start killing them, I'm going to let them kill the ones that is least, that is far away, that, you know what I'm saying, he just kind of say, I'm going to put these handmaidens first, and I'm going to put this guy, I ain't had been in marriage in the first place, because I'm going to trick me to marry Leah, then I want my baby, Rachel, and a good-looking son, Joseph, behind Verse 3. Verse 3 says this. Verse 3. Verse 3. 
and he passed over before them. Now, all of his children, now he get over in front. I want y'all to get this picture. He gets over in front of his family. And the Bible says, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Esau sitting there looking rough and tough. And the thing that Jacob has in mind is nowhere near his brother's mind. Come on, somebody. And it says, and he passed over before them, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times. It was a custom in Israel, a custom even to this day, that when you want to show that you honor and respect somebody, you bow before them seven times. Seven is always the number of completeness. And when you bow seven times because, see, a prophet went forth on Jacob that his brother, come on, the, the older was going to be serving the younger. Amen. In other words, but, but now notice what he's trying to, he's trying to fix up. See, he took that away from Esau. See, he, if he wouldn't have stolen from Esau, see, he would have been, see, can I tell you something? Now, he should have been doing that at the first, but he stole that from Esau, and now Esau, he is now bowing seven times before Esau, trying to fix something he done messed up. I get tired of trying to clean up what a messed up. <laughs> oh, y'all in here, come on, somebody. And now notice, notice in the text in verse 33, and Esau, notice he passed over, and Esau ran to meet him. But I bet his heart was just, Esau now is running to meet him. And I believe Esau, he would, I, because I believe Esau must have had his sword on, but he didn't take, I mean, he didn't just drop his, I think Esau just got off his horse. He was so happy to see his brother. He gets off the horse with his sword, and Joseph thinks, oh God, here you go. Come on, y'all. Get, let's get in the text now. Look in the text. He's thinking that I'm, I'm finna get killed. Because Esau, not only is he thinking, dang, Esau really wanted, he really wanted to get me right now. So Esau is not, they, they come walking toward him. Esau is running toward him. But wait a minute. He runs there and he meet him. And guess what he do? He embrace him. <laughs> we'll stand up for a minute, Wolf. I'm thinking Wolf in the, I'm thinking Wolf and knock me out. Wolf come running to me. <laughs> Do y'all get this? Yes. Seem comical, but this is exactly what must have been going on while Esau is bracing because he's glad to see him. Jacob trying to figure out where did I put my hands now? Should I put my hands on his sword so he won't pull it out to kill me? Have you pulled me close enough to kill me? I want y'all to get that picture. So sometimes we miss what's in the text because we don't know that all things that was written and written aforetime was written for our learning. There is a lesson in this text trying to show us about how, how that we deal with resentment and unforgiveness and sometimes you may be holding stuff that somebody else done forgot about so you begin to assume that they feel about them come on somebody the way you feel about them or feel about you the way they feel about you and and but but it might not necessarily be so and I want you to pull out from this lesson because in in this text you know can I tell you something now there may be some people in this room that you are certainly struggling with something that happened to you. Notice this happened to Jacob between Jacob and Esau 20 years ago. That long, this young, this man, Jacob, and having to deal with what he did 20 years ago. And all of us, some of us still have something we done way back. And every now and then it surfaced. You know it always surfaced the moment you're trying to move to another level with God? Come on, y'all. It seems like every time that you decide that I'm going to be, I'm going to get it right with God, that stuff that you did, the devil comes and says, wait a minute. <laughs> you, oh, you're going to get hold in there. Oh, you sang in the choir. Oh, you're going to be, oh, you, you up and doing an announcement at church now. Oh, you're going to be church boy now. And the devil always, what he does when God saves you. All the devil has is a picture because old things done passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
But what the devil do, he'll go to the sea of forgetfulness and pull up a picture of your past. And then bring it up and say, why are you in there singing and shouting like that when you know you did this? Come on, somebody. Sometimes you need to tell the devil yes and agree with the devil. And sometimes our problem, the reason why we can't get over stuff is because sometimes we don't own up to it and say, yes, I did that. It pays sometimes to just say that, yes, I'm guilty. I've done that. I, that was me. That's exactly right. That was me. I wore that at that time, and I did this, and I hurt you. But that's not me anymore because when Jacob had this, this limp, when he had this limp, it represented that God had changed Jacob's life. Notice, notice now, and can I say this to you? Jacob has been blessed beyond measure. And I don't care how blessed you are. I don't care how blessed you are, but, but you'll never find complete contentment in your life until you get past, amen, harboring resentment or unforgiveness towards somebody else. And I mean somebody, and, 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 and you get past feeling guilty over something that you did or committed in your past. You'll never have full, have, you, really, you, you would never really enjoy your life while you're still worrying about, okay, I wonder how, how Louise feel about the way I treated her. Or I wonder, I wonder, I, I wonder, do they know how I feel because they hurt me? And I know it probably nobody in this room ain't never harbored no resentment or unforgiveness against anybody. That's just these people in Scripture. They need help. Thank God that God wrote about them in the Bible because ain't nothing can be written about us. Because when somebody hurt us, we just let it go right then. We forgive them, we go and have church, and we're good. But I believe that the devil is a lie. In our text, as we know, God has blessed this man, um, this man beyond imagination. This man had, now he said, when I first left Israel, uh, Troy, he said, when I left, I only left, when I left home, all I had was a staff in my hand. God now has given him three women. He got all kinds of children. He got all kinds of cattle. He's got all kinds of, of money. This man is doing good. But in the midst of him doing good, he's not happy. How in the world do you think, how in the world can, can you, you do somebody wrong or, or you still feel hurt from somebody else? And, and with all the money that you got, all the stuff that you're dealing with, how in the world, why in the world are you not happy? Why are you still struggling? You, you got plenty of money, girl. You know, Jacob, Jacob, listen, you got all these cattle and you got all of these goats and you got all of these women. You got all these children. How can you not be happy? Let me tell you, I don't care how much you have in life. I don't care where you stay. I don't care what you drive. Things will not make you happy. Why do you think, why do you think that Joe, Jeff Bodines or whatever his name is that, that go on this, he killed himself. He traveled all over the world drinking wine and eating in fine restaurants. And yet one day after he was getting ready to do a film, he kills himself. This man got money beyond comprehension. This man is doing what? He, his name is all over the TV. And yet and still he goes in a lonely hotel room and he kills himself. How did that happen? Because stuff do not make you happy. Do you know why the shootings is going on in this nation? You say, well, 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 no, 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 no. Do you know why it's happening? Well, because of race. No. Do you really know why it's happening? You got people that are trapped in a spirit of unforgiveness and living under shade trees of, unresent of resentment for other people. And now the devil has gotten them to a place where all there are now are candidates for his eels. When you're living in unforgiveness and resentment is built up in your spirit, you have become a perfect candidate to do something stupid. The Bible says that to whom I forgave anything in Romans, in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, to whom I forgave anything, I forgave it in the person of Christ that lest Satan get advantage of me. Meaning that if you don't forgive, if you don't turn some stuff loose, Satan knows it's a matter of time before I get you to do something either to yourself or to somebody else. Come, let me go on this side because I know none of you in here know about that because can you imagine when you're mad at somebody, can, can y'all just be real, but just, just, all, just, just a couple minutes. 
Have somebody ever, and you got so mad that when you went and laid down, you thought about what you can do to them. And you thought about if that have, I mean, if, if, if you, oh, struggle real, y'all. I'm telling you, struggle real. I'm trying to keep my hood in. Amen, somebody. You've ever, can, can, come on, would y'all just keep it real? Can we keep it on the, can we keep it right here? You went home and when they did something to you, you said, if she do that to me again, if she ever do that, if she ever said that to me again, you have already put in your mind, you fixed in your mind what you're going to do if they done that again. And you thought about yourself, why in the world did I let that go by that time? I, mean, I, I, oh, I wish I had, I, I wish I, but, but you, 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 you fight yourself because you let them get away with something you thought they deserved better. Well, Pastor, what this got to do with this text? Got everything to do with this text and got a whole lot to do with you. Ain't no sense in preaching the word of God if it can't be applicable to our own life. God has God put people's lives and their stories in here so you can look and let you know you are men and women of like passion, just like them. And just like Jacob was feeling this, this kind of way because he had done some of this man, he knew God knew that some of us are experiencing the same things in life. And there's no, and, and no, and no sense in going through life and thinking it's going to be a bed, a, 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 a bed of roses. People hurt us sometimes. But the problem is, you hurt people too. Sometimes we can hurt people, but when we get hurt. Y'all remember the man that the Lord had forgiven him of this debt? And he begged and asked the Lord to give me all, forgive me all. And God forgave all of his debt. He goes out and finds somebody else that owed him far last, took him by the throat. And we said, I'm going to choke you, and you're going to pay me everything. And God says, listen, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt. Now you go out and find somebody. I forgave you a million-dollar debt, and somebody owe you $10. You're going to go call the police, po police, police on them. We do the same thing. Sometimes we harbor resentment against somebody because they hurt us. But if you do an inventory in your own life, you'll find out you did some stuff far worse than somebody else, and you deserve some stuff that you didn't get. Listen, listen. In the last sermon, Jacob left. He was wrestling with God, and, 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 and we just concluded that this man had a new walk, and, and God met Jacob. God met this man, Jacob, in this text at a critical point in his life. Jacob has grown older now. Jacob is more mature, and, and, and what was important to Jacob back then, he has found it's not worth not being with his family. And sometimes we have to come to a place where, you know what, the stuff is not worth your relationship with people. Wait a minute, Pastor John, hold it for one second. You mean to tell me I lent them $100 and they didn't pay me my money. You want me to just walk out of here and forget that? You must be going to bump your head. You're telling me, Pastor, that they embarrassed me? They did that to me. You telling me today? That I got to forget that? I got to know. I, I did not tell you, forget that. I ask you to forgive that. Amen. There is a difference. You can still remember stuff. Come on, somebody. And forgive people. Amen. I got cut on my hand. I got, a, I got a cut from right here, right now. I got a cut from here all the way down. The scar is still there. I can squeeze it and it don't hurt but I still can see the scar. Don't mean that it didn't happen. It just mean that I'm healed. <laughs> Meaning that somebody can hurt you and you still can look at them. Come on, somebody. You can remember what they did to you, but you still can speak. You still can say good morning. You still can bless them when they curse you. You still see the scar. You remember the time they said it. You remember the email, the, the texts they sent, the scandalized you. You remember all of that. But you know what? Every time it's good, it don't hurt no more. If it's still hurt, you have not been healed. You need to come to the balm of Gilead. Amen, somebody. So you can be healed. 
And the balm of Gilead, amen, is like a salve. It is, it is something that they put on wounds that you can be healed. I'm trying to tell you that balm, I'm trying to tell you that the blood of Jesus Christ, he can heal something. Does not mean that he, he won't let you go through stuff. It don't mean that he won't let people talk about you. Does not mean that people won't lie on you. Does not mean to shield you from the troubles of life. It just means that, praise God, he'll put you in a place where you can deal with it without being resentful. You said, Pastor, you know what? You're getting on my nerve right now. Because what I have done, I'm going to work in the morning. And I can lose my job. And some of you may have lost your job over what somebody did to you on the job. I don't know who I'm talking to. A lady walked to me this at 8 o'clock service and said, Pastor Jones, you were talking right to me. And Pastor Jones, and maybe you, maybe you did. Maybe you were molested when you was a little girl. Maybe, maybe, maybe you, you, you were molested. Maybe they was very nasty about it. Maybe you did tell your mom that you molested and she said, child, shut up. And now not only you are resentful against a man who did it, but you're resentful against your mom who did not receive what you said. Uh-oh, getting tight right now. I met a man that had been taken advantage of ever since he was a little boy until he was in his teens by an uncle who had raped him. One day I was preaching in this church about homosexuality. Amen. Hallelujah, somebody. And I was preaching about hidden secrets. I was preaching something similar to this, and this man, as I was preaching, he was getting angry. His partner, I didn't know his partner, was a, his partner got up and left the church, but he stayed. Because he wanted to see what else, what else did else, what else I had to say. He stayed. And he heard the word of God. Amen. And he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He brought me a black book that they had accumulated with men, nothing but men. And I was talking about how I kissed my wife and kissed my children. And he was saying, I wonder what that's like. He said, Pastor, I was wondering what that would be like. You're always talking about how you and your wife deal, and you talk about your children. He says, Pastor, here I am. I'm 40 years old, and never have I had a woman to kiss me passionately. The only woman that's ever kissed me was my mom. He said, I was wondering what that was like. And he began to talk about the man that he hated. And, and forget about, I mean, and he was talking about the people he resented because they were calling him names. There was a hurting man that needed to be delivered. Come on, y'all, come on. God delivered this man. Not only that, but he also contracted AIDS. But when he died, he died free. And I'm saying to you today that you can also be free from the hurts of life. Don't mean it didn't happen. It'd be crazy. It would be, it'd be a falsehood. It'd be a lie if you go around and saying that I don't feel this. And right now while I'm talking, there's some of you right now saying, Pastor, I feel this. I feel this, Pastor. I feel exactly what you're saying. But my problem is, Pastor, how I'm going to get past my past. How am I going to deal with this man that walked out on me and my children when I gave him everything that I had and yet I helped him get to the place and he walks out and leave me, amen, for a girl that didn't do anything for him? How can he treat me and my children like this when I gave my all to him? I committed myself to him 100%. How can he do this to me? Can I say this to you? The struggle is real. How, how can I deal with these people who has mistreated my ancestors and did this? How can I live with people like that? How can I be around people like that because of my answer? Y'all remember Jesus took his, his disciples to a place called Samaria? To a people in whom he didn't like? And God made him deal with it. I don't know if y'all listening to me or not. I, I don't know if y'all don't check. Have y'all checked out on me already? Is anybody getting anything out of this but me? Now, I'm going to say this to you. 
Jacob had wronged Esau, y'all. He stole this man's birthright, and he did. And, and yes, he took advantage of Esau's lack of spirituality because he knew Esau didn't understand the significance behind the birthright. It was more than just physical things. It was more than just material things. It was a birthright. It was a place with God. It was, it was a place in which God was going to use this person to keep the lineage of Jesus coming. It was more, but Esau, Esau didn't care about that. There are some people who don't care about stuff you care about. Come on, y'all. Some of your children, you want them to have this. They don't even care about that stuff. And you care about it. And I tell you right now, some of y'all are going to die, and two days after y'all dead, they're going to spend it all in three days. Y'all ain't going on vacation. Y'all ain't doing nothing. So I'm saving for my kids. And they don't even care about, they don't care about that car. Well, I've been saving this car. He's been in my family. I'm having antiques and beer. When As soon as you get, he's going to do a hot rod. He's going to spin all around the wheel. <laughs> we get wrapped up in the wrong things. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be about to close in a minute. But, but let me tell you something. Can I ask you something? See, Jacob, like you and me, we can't move on in life until we deal with the baggage of our past. See, God, God, can't, God can't take you nowhere until you deal with the baggage. The Bible says, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came. See, Jacob could not go and realize the fullness of what God had ordained for his life until he faced Esau. And there's some things in your life God has already set aside for you. It's yours. But God can't let you have it until you release Charles. It's some people, you're holding me hostage when you got a whole treasure to go and get. Nobody is that important. Nobody is that important for you to hold those grudges while God said, I can't give it to you, Anna. I can't give it to you, Vanessa. I can't give it to you, Brenda. I can't give it to you, John. I can't give it to you, Joe. Until you let them go. Because how are you going to receive it when your hand is gripping this? Because what I'm giving to you, you got to release that to take this. Yeah. Pastor, I hear all that your stuff you're talking about. I'd be glad when you get through. I wish you don't ever go on a vacation again because you always do this when you come back on vacation. <laughs> Can I ask you, who hurt you? And who has you hurt? It's time to deal with it. Girl, who hurt you? Brother, who hurt you? And who has you hurt and you, and you don't want to deal with it? Some of y'all need to go back. He said, leave your stuff to the altar. If your brother or somebody has offended you, then you go back and talk to him. And if they receive you, receive you. I mean, you, you, you want a brother, but if they don't, go take somebody with you so you can get this thing clear. That's a hard, that's a, that is a hard saying. That's hard for us to deal with, especially when you feel that you were right. Sometimes being right, <laughs> sometimes being right is not always to our advantage. Amen. Jesus never did anything wrong, and yet he died for you and me. Brother, can I tell you something? Don't you die and leave it on the field, so to speak. We that are jocks and like to play football or play basketball, the coach would always say, I want you guys to leave it on the field. Even if you lose by 50 points, you just have this mindset that I gave it my all. Don't you leave nothing on the field. Don't, don't, don't leave it. Let me tell you this. Guilt over wrong done or harboring an unforgiving spirit because you were wronged. Both has a power to make you dysfunctional if you can't get over it. Can I say that again? I'm going to read it again and make sure I say it right. Guilt, guilt over wrong that's done. A harboring or unforgiving spirit because you were wrong. Come on, somebody. Both has the power of making you dysfunctional if you don't know how to get past it. But, but Pastor, that, 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 that third wife of mine, I had to start all over again. That joker riding around in my car, she's still living up in my house. Ain't got three guys in my, in my house. And you telling me to let it go like that? I had to go out and, and pass Joe, not only that, but that woman still got me paying child support. I make $500 a week. I come home with $35. 
and you telling me to forgive her? And now she done got married again, riding around, in my, ride, riding around on my money. It don't take all that for them kids to be raised. <laughs> come on, y'all. I'm, I'm trying to come home now. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying, you know, because don't make no sense if y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, could y'all, could y'all admit that we, we, we right here on y'all street? I got some brothers in this house right now. You know, you're still paying child support. You was having fun, but you didn't know how much this fun going to cost. And now three baby mamas. Three baby, three baby mamas. Keep trying to go up on you. Every time you make a raise, she go down to judge and say, he got a raise, I get a raise. And she got new nails and new hair. Y'all know it's real. I don't know if y'all can handle a couple of messages because I want to tell y'all something in this text that sometimes we miss. And it's right here in Scripture. And God, God exposes and unzip people's lives in order so we can see our own. I said, would you come because I need to have music with what I'm about to say in closing. Because sometimes, man, I tell you, God asks you to do stuff you don't want to do and release people that owe you. <laughs> I, talked to, I talked to a lady. Her uncle had been raping her ever since she was three years old. She was asked one day as she got older to go to a funeral. She said, I can't go. The family said, why you can't go? I just can't go. And she finally said why she couldn't go. Because the man they, had, they were burying, that the man took her ever since she was three up until she was almost in her teens, taking her off by herself and, and raping her. See, y'all think life is a joke, man. Church ain't no joke. We don't come here. We don't come in preaching so y'all can hey, get sermonettes for Christianettes and don't go out of here and be changed. This word is life changing. Now, many times we ask you, you see, the only way you can get over some stuff like this is you make Jesus Christ not only your Savior, but your Lord. See, when He's your Savior, you can tell Him, I'm not obligated to do what you're saying. But when you make Him Lord, Come on, somebody. See, when, when, I, when I say Jesus is my Lord, that's saying that because a slave don't have any rights, you just have to do what the master say do. Whether you like it or not, you do what the master say do. Come on, somebody. So when I say Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. Save me from the things that, that has, has, has entrapped me, the things that hurt me. But Lord, now, now after you save me, Lord, I want you to be my Lord because also the Lord is responsible for everything that you need. Come on. It's on the Lord's account that I get my blessing. So today I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you have never done before. I'm not asking you to come and join the church. I'm not asking you to come and become a Baptist. I'm asking you to receive him that can make your life different. For six years, I hated a boy. I told him I was going to kill him. Six years, I had vowed. I told my mom, he's dead. I put word on the street that he was a dead man. For six years. Then all of a sudden, I came to church one day, and they was preaching about the blood of Jesus Christ. They was talking about how he can cleanse your life and how he can make you new again. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was tired of Charles. I gave my life to the Lord. He saved me. Come on, y'all. There I was. There I was. Singing in the choir. I was singing. I got in the choir, y'all. I was going around and being in choir anniversary. Me and my cousin, and we were singing all over the place, singing. Old ladies would kiss me on my mouth. Said, boy, you sure sung this morning? Then one Sunday, in a hot time, I was, I'd been singing, and an old lady kissed me on my mouth, and, and as I looked over her shoulder, the guy who had vowed that I was going to kill showed up to pick his mom up. Now, 
I'm looking at him and my mother clinging on my shoulder because now her boy doesn't gave up drugs and the boy done gave up women he saved. That was my boy leading that song. And now this boy sitting in his car and I'm standing everything that I remember what he did to me had flooded my mind. My flesh says there he is. But the Holy Ghost inside of me say walk over to him and invite him to church I thought to myself this ain't nothing but the devil speaking to me this ain't nothing but the devil but because he became not just my savior my Lord I obeyed even when my flesh didn't want to see when you turn and start walking even when you don't want to so I turned to face him as he was bracing himself on walking court, as he's sitting in the car, he didn't know what I was going to do. All he knew, the last words he heard that Charles Jones had said on the street that he was going to kill him. I'm walking with my church clothes on. And I leaned over to the car and said, hey, man, you come go to church with me next Sunday? He think, he, he thinking like, what that? What? He came to church the next Sunday, gave his life to the Lord, got saved. I'm a preacher, and now he's a deacon. All because of the blood of Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to tell you, if you accept him as both your Savior and your Lord, all the struggles you have, he'll help you with them. Everybody's standing on your feet. Everybody's standing. While the deacons are coming, deacons are coming. Councils are coming. If there's somebody here who says, Pastor, I want everything that God has for me. You can't get it until, first of all, you release everything that anybody ever done to you. And says, Lord, I'm coming to receive you as my Savior. Pastor Jones said that, Lord, you got something for me. It's already laid up for me. I, I mean it. Who would ever thought that this wannabe pimp God had in his plan for me to be a preacher? Who would ever thought that? I said to my mother last Wednesday sitting on the porch, I looked over at my mom who's 83 years old. I said, Ma, I nursed on your breast. I sat in your lap. I told my mother that last Wednesday. I said, you had no clue that you was nursing a preacher. You had no idea. My mother looked at me and she was speechless. She said, Charles, you know what? You're right. How you know? Whether or not God will unveil your destiny if you give your life to him today. If you're not saved, never trusted Christ, I want you to come. Nobody moving yet. Saved, pastor, I know I'm saved. I want to join this church. I want you to come. Maybe he says, Pastor, I don't need none of that. I just need you to pray for me because everything you said today, you're talking about me and I need prayer. Why don't you come now? You know where you are. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Don't be ashamed. Come on out. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. You come on. You know where you are. Don't let the devil hold you back from what God has you. Not one more day. Don't give him no more time. Not one more minute. Come on, sister. Come on. Come on, brother. Jesus said, if you're ashamed to own me before me, and I'll be ashamed to own you before my father. Satan tried to kill me at 21. I keep saying this, this is my story. I, got, I was getting so deep in the drugs, I watched my buddy kill a boy over a deal that went bad. I watched the blood pour from the boy. I watched his eyes get big. I watched my friend run. I watched the blood from his hands rubbing down the side of a car. God save me, y'all. If there's somebody here, Deacon Brown is here, and for the first time you want to come, ain't no lightning going to strike, ain't no thunder going to It's just simply, you know, and today don't mean that you're going to know how to do everything in one day. It's just that you're going to take that faith walk today. So, Pastor, that's me. I want to make Jesus my Savior and my Lord. 
Are you here? If you're here, come on, step over here to Deacon Brown. If you're here, if you're here, come on, baby. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? I want to make my Savior and my Lord today. Amen. Can we get a, can we get a mic? Look at me, babes. Don't you look at me for me. How old are you? How old are you? Hmm? How old are you? 26. How old are you, baby? 20. 20. Listen, long before we even got to God, knew y'all was coming. He knew. He knew long before. All these people in here, it's been about you girls the whole while. And I want you to do something that I did when I was 21. And I prayed. And I want y'all to pray this prayer. I want you to mean it. You're not talking to Pastor Jones. You're talking to the Lord. You're not talking to Deacon Martin. You're talking to the Lord. And I want you to mean it from your heart. You just watch how God began to unfold things. Because now, after the day when you pray, God don't hear you praying as somebody else. You're his kids. And he's going to take care of you. I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to close your eyes and shut us out for a minute. That's the only reason I ask you to close your eyes and pray this prayer. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for leading me here today. I'm so sorry for all the things I've ever done. Please forgive me. Pastor Jones, Pastor Jones said some today. And say this with me. Father, I want Jesus in my life. Please forgive me for my sins. And right now, I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believe God raised him from the dead. And he's alive. Come into my heart. Help me to live this Christian life. So right now, I believe that I'm saved. I'm your daughter. I'm your child. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, come on, come on, come on, y'all. Come on, Annie, y'all. Come on, y'all. We just had two, two young ladies give their life to the Lord. Claire, would y'all would y'all take them and just love up on them? Would y'all would y'all take them? Would y'all take them and love up on them? Maybe I got maybe I got somebody here saved and, and know you're saved. You want to rededicate your life to the Lord. You gave your life to the Lord. You just want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Lord, I've got out the way. I've I've strayed off. Would y'all come? Anybody just want to rededicate your life to the Lord? Amen, son. Saved. And all of us do it sometimes. All of us, we want to do it right. Sometimes, man, we stray off. And sometimes we don't get it right. But that's why Jesus came. And today I want to pray with you all. What's your name, son? How old are you, man? 31. How old are you, baby? 23. 23. How old are you? 22 years old. And you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. You've already accepted him as your Savior. And now you want to say, Lord, I'm, I'm tired of you being my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. And even when I can't do it, I, 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 I'm going to try to do it by faith. Pray this prayer with you. Father, in Jesus' name, I lift my kids up to God in the name of Jesus. And God, you know I've stood where these kids stand. And I pray for them in the name of Jesus. God, that prodigal came back. You didn't reject him. And God, and he knew he need to come back. Lord, they came too in front of all these people to say, not only are you their Savior, but Lord, you are their Lord. And for that, God, I pray that you would take them now and receive them and un unveil to them all that you have ordained for their life. And I give you praise. I give you glory. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can I get, can I get some, some, some guys? Would y'all, come on guys, come on, would y'all stand? Brother, we got some men gonna stand with you, man. Come on, see all these men? 
These men gonna stand with you, man. Anything you guys need, these guys gonna be there. Amen. Counselor, would y'all take and love upon them, love upon these people? Amen. Y'all gonna go with these counselors? Would y'all take Kim Kim Battles? Would y'all take it? They're gonna go, just go with them, man. They're gonna, they're gonna go with you for a little bit. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. <laughs> I want to, come here. God told me to just hug you. We're going to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much, God, for allowing us this privilege to speak this word on behalf of your son, Jesus. And Lord, these are your people, and you love every one of them, and you know every struggle that each of us dealing with. So God, in Jesus' name, give us the strength that we need, even though we've been wounded and we've been scarred. God, if we hurt, we know, God, we need healing. God, I ask you to strengthen her and strengthen him. In the places, God, Lord, we thank you. And we praise you for your word. Now, God, I commend these people to you. And I commend them, God, to your spirit that you might do in them a work that they can't do themselves. But we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a praise offering.